What happens in the sky affects life down here on Earth. The celestial compass shows you how and guides your way with astrology you can use from professional astrologer Kathy Beal. Every episode features her light-hearted practical forecasts and navigational tips, blended with humor, optimism, and a love of patterns, symbolism, and pop culture references. Kathy translates technicalities into concepts that apply to real life. You'll learn how the current moment ties to where we've been, from the recent past to cycles that last happened years ago, and get a look at where we're heading. And much more, from special topics to special guests. The Celestial Compass, enlightening, entertaining, and empowering. Here's your host, Kathy Beal. This is Kathy Beal of EmpowermentUnlimited.net. Uh, welcome to a, another episode of Celestial Compass. I'm going to start with a brief update on the forecast for January. And remember that you can find my forecasts at omtimes.com and also my website, empowermentunlimited.net. Uh, lots going to change really, really fast. Uh, we have uh, several really big things starting this uh, at the end of the month and we're walking into the doorway of the future essentially on the 20th pluto first uh sorry the sun meets with pluto and capricorn for the last time and we have some kind of intense purging evolutionary shudder dropping baggage before we walk through the doorway and then the sun and pluto move into aquarius the sign where pluto will eventually spend the next 20 years. We got a foretaste of what this is like from late March into mid-June of 2023. Um, you may feel it. I've always sensed a shift in the atmosphere when Pluto changes signs, but if you come away from listening to this and uh, go into the month and say, I don't know what she was talking about, just remember by mid-February, you will very strongly. Uh, after Pluto starts to uh, changes signs. We have the full moon in Leo, the opposite sign of Aquarius, on the 25th. Could be childlike, could be kind of drama and grandstanding. We'll see where that plays for people. But the uh, the ruler of Aquarius goes stationary direct on the 27th. That is Uranus, the cosmic agent, the cosmic uh, of change, quick agent of change, and uh, Uranus has been hovering at the same degree for quite a while now. And as it slowly moves forward, two things to note. Uh, one is we will have no retrogrades from Uranus's direct station until the beginning of April. So this is your all systems go time for the year. And as soon as Uranus turns around, it immediately has very easy flows with Mercury, Venus, and Mars at the end of the month. So surprises, minds opening up, crazy information coming in that you didn't know would be there, changes of heart, It'd be quite, quite exciting. Um, again, my forecasts are at empowermentunlimited.net and at Ohm Times. And today I am thrilled to welcome back uh, a UK astrologer, Steve Judd, who, let me give a little bit of background about him. He read his first astrological book in 1978. He's self-taught and he works for himself like so many of us. He was awarded the Master of Arts degree in Cultural Astronomy and Astrology at Bath Spa University in July 2005. In 1994, Steve was a founding member of the Big Green Gathering, coordinating the Earth Energies and uh, Divinatory Arts area until 2000. Over 45 years, he has records of nearly 35,000 horoscope readings with a loyal client base, many of whom retain him for monthly, yearly updates. He has 80,000 plus tube channel, which I highly recommend you follow. Uh, and has had many national TV appearances to his name. Uh, I could go on, but I will just welcome you. Hi, Steve. I'm so glad you're back. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> uh, I am most curious. What do you see as like the big picture for 2024? 
where it's going to take us, what it'll feel like. Um, everyone's got different ways of forecasting. Note right. the word forecast. Note the way. Note the word forecasting, not predicting. Right. Predictions get you into trouble. Um, before the new year started, I was doing all my new year forecasts for the videos for the year, and I thought I had a handle on what was coming up. Since the new year, I've done 41 personal readings so far in the last 11 days. So I've been really going for it. And when you do that many individual readings and you see similar patterns evolving, it gives you a, a viewpoint through the lens of individual clients into what's happening in the world. And there's a couple of things that, there's a few things that really, really jump out. Okay, I'm first, most curious. Firstly, it seems to me that the second five months of this year are going to be so much quieter than the first seven. I agree. So much quieter. Um, we do have a couple of massive, massive trigger points. You're absolutely right in your forecast. The Sun-Pluto conjunction at 29 degrees 59 of Capricorn in a few days from now, seven days from now, eight days from now, it's, it's humongous. It's absolutely massive. Both the Sun and Pluto will change sign within 12 hours of that conjunction. And we're seeing it in the world because there's so much extremism in both the political and the military world and the economic world at the moment. And that's only going to get sharper in the short term. And of course, there's the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction in the third week of April. And that is hitting so many people. But it seems to be not so much in terms of new drama as bringing things to a successful, well, hopefully successful conclusion. Uh, because after that, by the time we're into May, June, things do seem to start calming down. And, and there is a bonus because all the time, basically from now through to mid-March, late March, we've got this lovely Jupiter sextile Saturn coming in. Although at the end of the year, We've got Jupiter square Saturn for eight months. So that's going, the, the global economy is going to go up and down this year. This is not a year for, for, for radical speculation. Um, finally, the one thing I really am focusing on is the, it's still a, still a fair few months away, but the Mars retrograde mm -hmm. coming up at the end of the year, opposite Pluto three times. This is all the lead in to what's coming up in 25 and 26 with all the big planets changing signs. There's never been a time like this in history. We've never seen anything like this. This is, this is a standalone time. And, and in many ways, I think humanity is coming to the end of its apprenticeship. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. That's well, a very good way of putting it. I just had a wild, wild thought. Go on then. D D do you see any connection between this and what you've noticed about the changes in crop circles? Um, the number of crop circles has diminished rapidly in the last few years. And of those remaining, the quality of most of them are, are lower quality than in the past. There's still always two or three that are spectacular that make you take your breath away. But the numbers are decreasing. And I think that to me, the crop circles are a kind of. Um, evolutionary kick up the backside mm -hmm. you know the mathematical perfection when you when you get things accurate to a millimeter over over fifty thousand square yards of wheat laid down when it's at it's millimeter precise then then you know you have to pay attention to the patterns because as you as you know astrology basically at its core is pattern recognition mm -hmm. and patterning uh, patterns has been the sim single most common denominator throughout human history, our use of symbolism or, or reference to the sky and seeing patterns in the sky or patterns on the ground or patterns in our architecture has been, has been a, a constant theme over, over millennia. And now it seems that we're approaching that point at the narrow end of the pencil sharpener where it's all compressing. And then hopefully when we get through that, boom, we expand into glory. That'd be nice. 
Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Didn't you say you thought that the crop circles had come to an end or to an ending? Uh, or Yeah, I did. Um, the crop circles of this year, I believe, are the ones that are showing us, okay, now the, the cycles are coming to a close. The crop mm -hmm. circle, the earliest records we have of crop circles are about 1500, 1550. Uh, the poet Longfellow recorded them as being around in Elizabethan days in Britain, but as soon as she died and King James came to the phone, the crop circles seemed to stop. There's also records of crop circles from the 1850s, and I've spoken to people whose grandfathers and fathers knew them in the 1920s onwards to the present day. So this is not a new phenomenon. But the intensity and the quality of the patterns in our fields has never been as it is now. And I put this down to the rapid acceleration of evolution in, in, in human population, technology, spirituality, and they're responding to us in ways that we respond to them. I'm sure I know that the crop circles do not come from outside of uh, the Earth's field. They're not alien or ET. But I, I don't do alien. I do different dimensions of existence, not aliens or ETs. <laughs> so. I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you for, for indulging me that that uh, detour. Um, wh what are your, what's your thinking about like, the, the early experience of Pluto moving into Aquarius? <sighs> I am beginning to form some ideas now, only recently, only in the last month or two. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a step back. I remember when Pluto, I, I discovered astrology when Pluto was in mid-late Libra. Mm -hmm. So when Pluto and, and Saturn together moved into Scorpio, we all went, oh, great, nuclear war, end of the world. And we saw the end of the nuclear threat. We thought we'd see a sexual revolution and we got HIV. And then Pluto moved into Sagittarius and we thought, great, it's the end of religion. And sure, church attendances went right down, but the rise in fundamentalism mm -hmm. balanced that out. And then Pluto moved into Capricorn in 2008 and we said, okay, this is the end of the attempt for the global government. And instead now we've got global corporations that are taking over as much as governments or banks. Not, I'm not into conspiracy theories. I'm, I'm far too old for that. Um, <laughs> but um, now Pluto moving into Aquarius. Of course, it would be absolutely lovely if this was the harbinger of a, of a much more broader global community where over the coming years, things like borders and nationalities and, and the difference between genders and races and ethnicities all gradually merged into one. And the idea of one species, one one homogenous species on the planet, as opposed to different everything, would be an, a lovely representation of Pluto and Aquarius. But you can bet your bottom dollar that the I'm not going to name individuals, but you know the corporates, the power brokers, the banks, the the governments, all who have a vested interest in retaining a degree of influence or power in in the lives of themselves, their country, their people, aren't going to want to lose any of their influence. Mm -hmm. And yet they're going to. And it's just a question of whether they do it willingly or kicking and screaming. History tells us they'll do it kicking and screaming. Mm -hmm. So I do expect in, uh, an, a, a, a quite big upturn in the next year or two of radical action both in terms of what we in the West see or are told to see as terrorism or something like that, or what other people might see as militarism. It's going to get messy, yes. But I am really pinning my hopes on the time when Saturn and Neptune have finished their journey into Aries and Uranus is in Gemini and Pluto's in Aquarius and then Jupiter will be at zero Leo. And, you know, May 26, May, June 26, I really see this as a kind of crunch point. And it's like I've always been waiting all my life for this time and, and perhaps a lot longer than that. It's, it's a symbolic point where 
the decisions we collectively and individually make in the second quarter of 2026 are going to send fishing lines into the future for a very, very, very long time, for the rest of our lives and probably the lives of our children as well. I love that image, fishing lines into the future. That's, that's a beautiful, beautiful image. Magnets attracting, uh -huh. pos attracting positivity. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is great potential. I mean, if you think back mm. in just in history, in the late 1700s, this transit saw the rise of the middle class, which was new, and the concept of democracy also in France. Mm -hmm. Both of these happened in France. And it was messy. It was very messy. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's going to set my chart off in the most astonishing ways. And, I, and I, I have to say, if you ask me what happened between late March and mid-June last year, I would say, I don't know, except for watching chat GPT and people playing with AI images online. Uh, but in terms of my personal life, no. And many of my clients are still kind of in the dark too. But the more I get into astrology on the ground this year of consulting with people, same as you've experienced, it's it's just blossoming of, oh, this is what it means. Here is where this is going. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and rarely does astrology work to the day, although Uranus can actually do that. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I am very um, both anticipatory and trepidatory around this 19th, 20th of January time. It's a, such a surgical sharp laser point. Mm -hmm. Sun conjunct Pluto at 29.59. You know, you don't, you just don't get stronger than that. Mm -hmm. And it could get very messy indeed. I hope not. And I'm, I, you know, but all, me and all my friends, we got candles going, we're just putting out the right energy. Right. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm in a visual, a meditation group every week, does the same sort of thing. Like this, yeah. Yeah. Keep it calm. Keep it calm. Here we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that you're right. Um, I see it as it's like psychic surgery. There is something coming down on that day, and the yeah. last degree mm. of every sign is the most e extreme expression of it. And this is yeah. the last degree in the last minute. So uh, we'll see what all of the really rich people in the world do on that day. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Just as an aside, <clears throat> there's one astrologer to another. Isn't it interesting? how people with a lot of planets at zero or 29 degrees of the sign show much more um, patterns of that sign than people with planets in the middle of the sign. You'd think that planets on the cusp would show both signs of a cusp, but you know, you find people with the sun at zero Scorpio or 29 Scorpio, they're much more Scorpionic than people with the sun at 14, 15, 16 Scorpio. And that replicates into all the other signs as well. I don't know why that should be. But I, it I is. Love, I experience it too. I've observed it yeah. too. Yeah. I, I love so many people say to me, how does astrology work? And I love it. Well, I love watching their faces when I look at them and go, I ain't got a clue. <laughs> because aren't you honest? <laughs> if you knew how it, if I knew how it worked properly, I wouldn't do it. Because I love the mystery. I love the part of it that's irrational and unexplainable. Having said that, I love working with it. I love let. I love working. I love. I love the feel of it working through me. Or, to be precise, to use my language, I love it when she flows through me. Because to me, astrology is a she, and it's not hippie woo woo stuff, folks. I genuinely know this to be true. Astrology has life force and valence. It has a power of its own. It is not just an art or and a science it has a life force i totally agree thank you for phrasing it like that um if we could float back to 2024 for just a a, a second here um what else has your attention i mean like your particular attention what do you find yourself going back to and mm, you know for the year well, I'm looking how Mars is triggering a lot of things in the first six months of the year. That was on my list to ask you about how you use Mars in your forecasts. Oh, this is really strange, Kathy. Now, because I've done workshops with people and I've gone, 
well, I can't talk about Venus transits because I don't really get on with Venus and I don't notice Venus transits or Jupiter transits that much. I notice Mars and Saturn and other people will enter and go, I really notice Venus and Jupiter, but I don't notice Mars. And I think it's got to do with the strength of the individual planet in your own personal chart as to how, how you work with it and how you relate to it, how you resonate with the emanations of it. But um, I resonate with Mars. Mars. Mars never lets you down. Um, I have Mars on opposite my son right now, so I'm not at my most tactful, subtle or diplomatic, okay? Um, <laughs> um, but um, you can feel Mars energy. You, I defy anyone to contradict their astrologer nine times out of ten when Mars is on or opposite their moon, you know that everyone knows. They may not know that Mars is opposite them on their moon, but if an astrologer says to them, okay, these dates, Mars is on your moon, and then they get crabby or irritable or emotionally volatile, yeah, you know that one. Mm -hmm. Same as like Saturn on your sun or Saturn on your ascendant. You, you know it. It's there. You cannot deny it. Of course, the astronomers, the scientists, the rationalists will, will, will poo-poo it and deny it, but that's in a way that's what they're there for <laughs> so mars is doing quite a bit in the first part of the year i mean i personally do track it as a trigger uh i was having a conversation with another astrologer about this last night and once a degree gets sensitized for example an eclipse degree or the uranus uh the jupiter uranus 21 degrees taurus degree every time mars makes a hard contact to that to things move yeah and there's going to be a mars jupiter conjunction later this year around about 16 17 gemini that's mm. worthy of note as well mm. oh and what else is happening there hmm i wonder that's where the first uh jupiter saturn square is 17 it is mm -hmm. it is indeed yes and that jupiter saturn square the jupiter saturn trine we sextile we have now is 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 fire to 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 earth uh, sorry water to earth so it's quite harmonious but the square will be in two mutable signs and the relationship between virgo and gemini it's such a paradox because they're so similar and so different you know one of them's always trying to logicalize and rationalize and sort things out and the other one's always trying to do it properly and perfectly and then they're similar but Oh, they get on each other's nerves. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, don't, I, I think that Saturn-Jupiter square at the end of the year is going to see a downturn in certain economic areas. Here's an interesting stat. In May and June of last year, Britain powered more of its generating ability for electricity from wind power than it did from nuclear coal and oil put together, hmm. which is impressive. Um, mind you, we do have a lot of wind off the British Isles, but um, slowly we are weaning ourselves away from oil. And that's only going to accelerate over the coming few years. Oil is a mainstay of the global economy up to date. So if the oil consumption goes down by 50% globally, which I expected to over the coming five to six years, what will happen then? So I do think there's going to be a few economic shifts and changes. There's certainly going to be a lot of political changes with elections coming up in France, Britain, America in this coming year. It's a very turbulent time. And I do think in many ways, everyone and everything is jockeying for position to capital, to make the best of what's coming up in 25 and 26. And they're doing it unconsciously, of course, because they, they don't use astrology. <laughs> or, but, uh, or, or admit to it. Or admit to it. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? Yeah, it's kind of, it's revealing how much this is used uh, in other places, uh, in places that you wouldn't expect and they won't own up to publicly, but it's there. Oh, yes. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And we're not oh. going to talk about our individual clients in these areas at all. Oh, no. <laughs> Some of those are quite revealing, too. Um, yes. This is a good point for us to pause for a minute. So we're going to take a break and uh, hang on, everyone. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Want help with your own celestial compass? Visit my site, empowermentunlimited.net, for Astro Insight forecasts for each week, month, and new and full moon. Want to explore the personal impact? Make a decision? Understand another person? (laughs) It is possible. Click the Services tab to book a personal session with me. That address again? EmpowermentUnlimited.net And welcome back to Celestial Compass. We're talking today to Steve Judd, an astrologer based in the UK who has uh, wonderful, wonderful insights uh, into uh, humankind, the planet, the world at large. And we've been talking a lot about what's coming up in 2024. And we had started to talk about the role of Mars and you using Mars in your forecasting. And I noticed that when I was listening to uh, I think it, uh, forecasts for different signs that you had put up on your YouTube channel. And you mentioned particular dates when Mars was going to touch various things. And mm-hmm. I thought, I don't do, that. huh, isn't that interesting? So I wanted to uh, ask you to elaborate on what you see, what is Mars's journey? It's really active through about July, right? Yeah. And then it starts to slow down. Um, it's lovely when you can step outdoors in the evening and go, ah, oh, there's Jupiter, there's Saturn, and then 5 a.m. in the morning, there's Venus. And if you're very good, you can see Mercury right now as well, just for a few days. And, of course, you can't see Mars at the moment because it's too close to the sun. But as it slows down, or as the sun moves further away from Mars, it, from our perspective, so we'll start seeing Mars um, in the evening. Uh, and, we're, and it should be quite bright by the time we're into June, July. Mars has a two-year orbit, approximately, but that doesn't mean it spends two months in each sign, no. It spends an average of six weeks in each sign, and then as it slows down or speeds up, there's one or two signs it will spend a long time in. It's going to be nearly seven months between the start of Leo and the end of Cancer over the end of this year. So those people born in the last five days of cancer and the first five days of Leo, (laughs) yeah, you're going to get energized at the end of this year. You you can use it or it can use you. If you use it, you'll become dynamic, projective, assertive. If it uses you, well, bumps, bangs, burns, bruises, broken bones, you know. Um, Mars passing through a sign Average six to eight weeks. During that time, it will pass over the sun sign position of every one in that sign. And the echoes of that will resonate a week or two each side. So it's a fair bet to say that when Mars moves into a sign, then every member of that sign is going to get a one to two percent energetic increase most of the time. And when Mars is actually on your sun, you can actually get a great deal more done. You, you, your energy level should be up by 5 to 10%, which is very noticeable. Mm-hmm. You can get a lot done. And you can also get he- hot-headed, impulsive, rash, impulse, volatile and accident-prone and clumsy. Uh, it's, it's an old one from astrology, very old, but I still say it. When Mars is on your sun, don't play silly games with sharp metal objects. <laughs> Because Mars is red, it rules iron and the blood. So you can really damage yourself. <laughs> so you have to be cautious. It's But again, the planets impel, they don't compel. You have the freedom of choice. You can just blank the whole lot out and ignore it, as many people do. And the effect, planets will still have an effect, but nowhere near as much as if you were actually taking notice of them. So there is a cause and effect thing here. If you choose to vol- deliberately work with astrology, it will have a far more greater effect upon you than if you choose to ignore it. Which is another reason why I say it has valence and life force. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts about 
Mars meeting Pluto in the middle of February. Valentine's Day here in the U.S. I don't know if it's a uh, 15. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, well, if you hide under the bed, the bed will probably collapse on top of you. That's a good way of putting it. Right. Um, but I will not be going out partying that night. And I would advise most of my friends to actually be circumspect and 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 count to ten at that time because Mars conjunct Pluto has the subtlety of a sledgehammer. In fact, that's a really good analogy because with Mars conjunct Pluto, you can either be a blunt, red hot sledgehammer or a sharp, focused homeopathic laser. The choice is yours. Um, incisiveness can sometimes be a lot more acute than than hitting something with a sledgehammer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um you haven't yet mentioned the american eclipse oh i was i was going to move to that mars on the eclipse and chiron uh yeah. the solar eclipse in uh in uh, april what do you think about that I've got a few people who are going to drive down to that spot, spot in Texas where the last eclipse and this eclipse cross over. And I'm thinking, uh, yeah, all right. I'm not doing that. I mean, viewed from a more, not mystical perspective, but perhaps slightly magical perspective. When the moon is at the right distance from the earth and in the same degree of latitude and longitude as the sun, it will completely cover the earth's the surface of the sun. Of course, astronomers say it's completely coincidence that the sun is 382 times wider than the moon, but 382 times further away from the earth than the moon is. Because uh, if that wasn't exact, we wouldn't get total eclipses. Um, the light of the sun will be obscured. The, the light bringer, the life giver, will be shut off from us for a few minutes, or at least people on the eclipse path. Having experienced a total eclipse in England in 99, you see the animals, you see all the birds land, the animals gather together in circles, mm -hmm. and, and humans will drum or light fires to keep the energy going. But the light of the sun is cut off from us. We are occluded. And um, it's quite a scary thing because it's like, if that were to last long, a lot longer, everything and everyone would die. We take it for granted that the sun will rise every morning. And of course, it's because the earth is spinning that that happens. But without the sun, we wouldn't be here. It's, it, it's... So when there's an eclipse of the sun, I think it's a time to celebrate the dark within ourselves just for a brief moment of time to get in touch with the dark, because if you can't deal with the dark, don't deal with the light. Dark isn't negative. It's just dark. And Pluto, of course, and to a lesser extent, Chiron is the gatekeeper of the dark. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I consider myself a dark worker as much as a light worker. Uh, and as astrologers, sometimes it's our job to go into other people's darks and pull them out, mm -hmm. not to heal them because otherwise they get addicted to us. We're not healers. We're catalysts. Right. I agree completely. We empower them to do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. mm. So what do you make of the fact that Mars is going to be in the, in the dance when this happens in April? The ruler of the sign will be there in the sign. Not subtle, yeah, but I Aries. think Mars is going to be in Aries on that eclipse, isn't it? Yeah, right. On the eclipse. See, I've been telling people it's like we're all going to have IV drips of energy drink. Let's put it this way. I wouldn't want to be near any fracture lines. <laughs> okay? Because I imagine there'll be a degree of um, volatility at the geophysical level in one or two spots on the world. Mm -hmm. and it is a fact that jupiter uranus interactions are big signifiers of geophysical activity there's an earthquakes i know this mm -hmm. to be true 
So April is a big time for that since we have the eclipse on the 8th and then the, the yeah. exact of the conjunction on the 21st. 20th, yeah, I, I shall. Yeah, I'm going to be the other side of the world at that time. So I shall be. I don't know. I don't, I, I'm just. There's an advantage to being older, Kathy. I'm now well over three quarters of the way through my life. So my relationship with mortality is becoming more and more of a daily thing. As a result, I care less and less about not how long I live. Well, I do. Of course, I care about how long I live. I've got things to do. But death doesn't scare me so much now as it would have done 10, 15, 20 years ago. The method of my death is going to be a bit interesting. But to me, death is just a transition of consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not exactly looking forward to it, but um, I'm in no rush. But when I get there, I will go willingly, knowing that I'm heading into a vastly expanded perceptive field. The next grand adventure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm quite, it's quite exciting, really. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people will look at you and go, you're absolutely crazy. What are you on about? But they're the people that are so caught up in the material world that death is fearsome and scary. Mm -hmm. And and and, and then, there's, then there's all the people who, um, oh, I better be careful how I say this. It's the people who believe what they've been told over millennia, that when you die, you go to heaven or hell. I got it. Mm hmm. Hmm. I say nothing on that apart from the fact that I choose to disagree with those ideas. <laughs> They're just ideas. <laughs> so and what's lovely is that in this last 10 to 15 years, just since the internet's really taken off, astrology has really come into its own. 20 years ago, what do you do? I'm an astrologer. Oh, you don't believe that rubbish, do you? And now, now with my neighbours, what do you do, Steve? I'm an astrologer. Oh, what do you think about Pluto moving into Aquarius? What? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, and and everyone, so many people now don't just know their sun sign; they know their moon sign and their ascendant. It's becoming the new lingua franca of the emerging consciousness revolution. Well, isn't that a Pluto and Aquarius possibility? I think it really is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um i went one of my friends is a stand-up comedian and he was the inspiration for me to do my stand-up with astrology and of course dick astrologer my evil twin brother who is not coming out to play today but okay. um he, he come sometimes he's, he's just got this line he upsets everyone he says right close the churches close the synagogues turn them into community centers you know and so and everyone's going <gasps> Oh, that's a good idea. You know, it's it's time now. We're beyond the need for someone to look after our spiritual soul. We can do that for ourselves now. We all have our own relationship with spirit and with the divine. I have a great relationship with divinity. Uh, the goddess works, with, I work with and for the goddess. I have no qualms in stating that. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, yeah, things are changing at an exponential and accelerated rate, and it's still getting faster. We're on a wave of change. The evolution is, is at a breakneck speed now. And, of course, the reactions to we see all around the world, the, the shock, the horror, the media just giving us constant fear and terror, trying to isolate us rather than bring us together. But it's like the last death gasp of the old dinosaurs. I, I, I still... Maybe it's my Sagittarius moon, but I can't help but feel optimistic about the long-term future for humanity, one way or another. And I do think that Pluto in Aquarius, it's got to be better than Pluto in Capricorn. Pluto in Capricorn has been dour. I'm sure all Capricorns would agree. Um, so, yeah, I'm quite looking forward to Pluto and Aquarius. It leaves Aquarius, when is it, 2030? No, no, 2042, 2043, about 20 years, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I might see it, 
I'll be in my mid late eighties, late early nineties when that happens. So I don't know if I'll be here then. I, 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 the idea of Pluto moving into Pisces is as soon as I think of that, I think, Ooh, don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, our relationship to the seas will oh, be... Oh, well, indeed. I am really looking forward to Saturn and Neptune moving out of Pisces. I think Saturn in Pisces has done quite a good job so far, but Neptune in Pisces... I mean, over the years, I've become more and more aware of how difficult Neptunian energy is to work with. It's, yes, it's got its lovely side around compassion and empathy and artistry and spirituality and intuition and music and film and art. It's lovely. But it's also about fatigue and gullibility and escapism and avoidance and deception. And in Pisces, it's been, it's been messy. It's mm -hmm. been messy. It's brought a lot of brain fog and fatigue into people's lives. There's still a lot of people recovering from COVID, mm -hmm. long COVID. Right. And I do feel there's a slight connection there with Neptune. In... As someone who survived COVID twice, once with Delta, once with Omicron, I never experienced anything like that in my life before. I choose not to buy into the conspiracy theories. But I also know that what I experienced when I had Delta was unlike anything else I've ever experienced, and it wasn't uh, a natural a, a disease that occurs in nature. So I'm sure that uh, COVID was, was that there was an artificial element in COVID. Whether it was released deliberately or as an accident or whatever, I don't know, and I don't, I don't care. You know why get caught up in all of that? It was out. It's out. It's like with AI today. At first, I was like, oh, I don't like this. And then I became aware that AI is already writing sun sign forecasts for some newspapers. And then I got contacted by this French group who are starting to bring AI into doing readings for people. And I was like really angry at them at first. And they said, well, let's try it with your charm. I said, okay, then. So I gave them my data and the result was absolute rubbish. It was dire. I thought, well, this is useless. I said, look, you know, you, you've got it. This just doesn't work. And I said, how can we improve it? And then I sat and thought, I thought, well, it's out of the bottle. Genie's out of the bottle. It's not going to go away. Mm -mm. So instead of criticizing it, why don't we train it? If we could find, somehow imbue AI with notions of compassion, empathy, spirituality, kindness, that type of thing, it could become a very useful tool. It will never be able to synthesize it will be mm -hmm. able to delineate, to be able to give brilliant computer printout reports, but it will never be able to do sim sinistry or, or to synthesize individual strengths or weaknesses because AI can't do magic. Humans can. Oh, that's a beautiful way of putting it. We, we completely underrate the element of magic in our lives. You know, when I sit in front of people and say, look, the bottom line is you're all born psychic. You just had it conditioned out of you. Right. Wake up. Wake up. Uh -huh. You can do magic. And then they do and they go, oh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's lovely. I'm, well, not, that's I'm, a I'm sorry, go on. I'm not a magician, but I am getting to the point where I'm becoming a bit, someone called me a mage. That's a and nice I thought, thing. Oh, that's so nice. I like that. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a good lead into speaking of synthesizing, pulling together a couple of things that you've been addressing. In uh, September, we have the first eclipse in the Virgo Pisces group, yes. and it has Nept. It's a it's a lunar eclipse in Pisces, and Neptune is conjunct the eclipse. Have you yes. thought about this any? Um. I can't help but feel that Neptune in, Aquarius, in in Pisces, and to a lesser extent in Aquarius before it, is a kind of astrological significator for the accelerating environmental destruction that's going on. Oh, that's interesting. And as we Neptune reaches an end, as draws towards the end of Pisces now, we're realizing that actually 
there is no way back now. There is no way back. It's too far gone. The planet will not cool down again in our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes. So they can bluster and talk about and promise all they want. But even if they just turned all the smokestacks off now, all of them, like now, still wouldn't work. And they won't do that. Money. So what's the option? I'm sure the rich will be thinking, oh, I could go and live on a space station. But good luck on that one. Um, other people are talking about genetic modification. Change our bodies to adapt to the environmental changes, which is a bit too sort of cyborg-like for my, for my liking. Part of me is really glad I am the age I am. Mm -hmm. But then when I talk to my granddaughter about this, she goes, yeah, but we can do this and we can do that. And they've got the enthusiasm and the vitality and the drive and the hope of youth. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to disenchant them. So I want to, I want to push them forward because they can make a difference. I love the fact that 90% of people in the world now who know their sun, moon and ascendant are under the age of 25, 30. You know, it's it's a young person's, it's going to be, it's becoming more and more of a young person's thing. Great. My, my, my techie guy, he looks at my YouTube stats. He goes, most people are viewed by everyone between 18 and 25. Most of your views come from 60 old, people older than 60. You're completely bucking the trend here. But then that's astrology for you because astrology imb imbues not just knowledge, but wisdom. Mm -hmm. But it is getting into the younger generation and they are the best hope for this planet. They uh, uh, Because they're entering the area where they can vote and they can spend money. And the more they do it according to their ethical philosophies, I retain optimism. I do. But boy, it's been a long 68 years if you get my drift. <laughs> I understand. I understand. And I share your optimism. I have a 29 degree Jupiter. So <laughs> how can I not? <laughs> yeah. Um, one other thing about the, uh, the eclipse in uh, September with Neptune on the moon and and that is do you think that might have something to do with starting the um the wrap up of what neptune in pisces has meant that starting the in September. yeah 25 yeah it's close isn't it? it's very close to neptune yeah two mm -hmm. degrees away yeah uh it's also very strongly trying uranus and weekly square Jupiter. That's going to be quite a big eclipse. Um, but then what do eclipses do? You know, opinions change on eclipses. Eclipses of the moon are much more common than eclipses of the sun. So a lunar eclipse, opposite Neptune, square Jupiter, trine Uranus, it's just going to act as some type of trigger. It's going to dissolve a lot of old ideas around environmental management. Mm -hmm. But it's also going to, in, with square Jupiter, it's going to promise lots that won't be delivered. But with a strong trine to Uranus, very strong trine to Uranus, the strongest aspect is that, then um, as the old fades away, so the new has got room to come in without negotiating old baggage. You can't bring in new things unless you let go of the old first. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. They just want to move from one safe zone to another. Uh, good luck. Yeah, don't work. You have to let go of the old before the new can come in. And that's a scary thing for a lot of people. But as astrologers, we have to encourage them to do it, to feel the fear and do it anyway. And afterwards, the older they get, the more I look back and go, well, somehow I've always put food on my table, clothes on my back, roof over my head. I must be doing something right. Mm -hmm. So... It's, it's, it's strange that as we get older, we get more open to taking chances at the spiritual and, and psychological level, just as the body's beginning to go, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm getting old, you know. So it's a trade-off. Wisdom and experience 
versus the abilities of the body as we age. Another good way of putting it. Um, well, all right. So I, I, I greatly appreciate that you have shared so much today. Can you tell people what you're up to these days? Because I know you're, you've made some changes too. I've made a lot of big changes. Um, I'm, I'm going across almost to America in a couple of weeks' time. I'm going to spend 12 days in Bermuda, seeing a lot of clients there. I may be going to Singapore later this year. That's I am going to Tasmania. Um, but that's for a private function. I do have something very big. I've got my new, I've got a couple of books on the go, new book of transits, um, and um, a book on Mercury. I do have something else very big, very big, biggest thing I've ever done in my life. And I cannot breathe a word of it. Mm -hmm. I've got three or four people working with me. We've all signed NDAs with each other. It will be released to the world in May 26, uh, May 25. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, I'm not saying a word, but it's going to be my legacy. Ah, that's exciting. Yeah. And you're teaching, right? You're still teaching? Oh, God, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, this, uh, every year I say this will be my last year of teaching. <laughs> still doing it. Uh, beginner's course starts end of February, six weeks on the polarized of the signs, you know, Aries, Libra, and then six weeks on the individual planets, and then six to seven weeks on the aspects, and then the intermediate with things like astrocartography, nodes, synastry, midpoints, you know, that type of thing. And then the advanced course in September, which is basically how to utilize and get the best out of transits and progressions, how to actually make astrology work for you and how to read a chart. Uh, I have another website. Yes, it's stevejudd.co, but all my teaching and my books is, you'll love this name. I think I've told you it before. Yeah, but go ahead. Astrobabbleproductions.com. It's a great name. I agree. That's what I babble about astrology. So... It's my pa Can you tell it's my passion? Uh, yes, yes, it, it comes through quite clearly. Uh, so would you repeat the names of your websites again, the addresses, so people yeah. can look? stevejudd.co, C-O, and um, astrobabbleproductions.com. And you have a YouTube channel as well. Steve Judd Astrology on, on, on YouTube, 80... Six eighty-seven thousand subscribers last time I looked. And you you tend to put out you you put out videos fairly regularly, and they're short. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not in, not into doing hour long. Five minutes. That's most people's attention spans. And I'm going to be doing a lot of videos in this next couple of days. By the time this broadcast goes out, there'll be a few more up there. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and I know we're running out of time, so I just want to say this. Please. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for astrology by pushing it out there in broadcasts like this. Oh, thank you so much. Well, it's people like us who are putting astrology into the world. That's true. Well, I've been translating it for the mainstream since high school and trying to normalize it and say, here, this is, I, it was during the um, uh, Saturn Uranus activity in the late eighties that uh, I started writing for a regular newspaper. The, the heading was why this year has been so weird. And it just went from there. So Fine. put it in the terms people can get because they they know something's going on. Don't you get messages from people who are not into astrology saying what's happening? I know something's happening. We got cut out and we lost it and we're back. Uh, I don't know what happened. And yeah, we're back. All, so all the, all the time, all the time. And I just say to them, ask yourself. Ah. Look inside, ask yourself. If you're not going to come to me for a professional level, then if you're either going to commit or you're not. And if you're not, then fine, just ask yourself. That is a great ending point. I thank you so very much for your time. I really appreciate you sharing all your wisdom and good humor with us. And uh, thanks, everybody. Hang on, and uh, we'll talk to you again in February. Bye now.